Today is Monday, June 3rd. The 2024 Mets are nothing short of a disaster. They are in every game and they are out of every game. And we have a lot to cover. Two weeks of very interesting Mets baseball. Let's talk about it. Welcome back, guys. It's been a couple weeks. A lot has happened in Mets land. Jerry Blevins is with me. I'm so happy to report that he does have his voice back, feeling better after a bat it's, with some sickness. It's a full octave lower now. <laughs> That's permanent. No, I'm, right? I'm happy to have it. Happy to be back. It's still not 100, percent but we are ready to work. We're ready to go back to work. And there's been a lot of losing, Jerry. I gotta say, the timing of you losing your voice couldn't have been better. Cause it saved us from, <laughs> I just was screaming into the ether without actually having volume in my voice, watching, watching the Mets collapse day after day uh, it's in the been, bullpen. I feel like I've aged which has been, years. They were so good. The bullpen was so good. This is like, um, I mean, there are bright spots. You can look at it however you want. Sure. There's, there's things that you can see they're in every game. They've been winning a lot of games then they just lose it at the end. Um, that's tough. That's a tough pill to swallow. Um, Cause you're like, Oh no, how are we going to figure this out to lose again? <laughs> that's, that's crazy. Um, I think it's one of the worst fan experiences because they don't let you quit. They're in every game for eight innings and they play well. They look like a talented team and then it just collapses under them. It really is something. I think I think that's the key for me is they, this, at least this team, you know, you had talked to me a little bit about comparing to the 2018 team and kind of our collapse there sure. and the underperformance. This team has fight. There's there's <clears throat> there's no dysfunction. Mm. Yeah, they took a really think, nice picture yesterday after the game. Did you see that? No, they're all like happy, like chilling in the bus. Took really a really nice selfie. They don't look like they're imploding, which is why it's weird that they're so bad. Now, I think a lot of people want them to feel like be right. angry and yeah, but that's just for show. You can't live your life like that. Yeah. The 18, the 2018 team, we were full of dysfunction and it started with Mickey Calloway and that whole fiasco that just, and then we had underperformances. This team is just underperforming and then they're, having bad games at the bat at bad, mo bad moments in big moments. Yeah. So when, uh, when the offense actually steps up the starting pitching or the bullpen or both collapse and vice versa. So it's been like the opposite of how you pick up your teammates. You, they've been learning new ways to let each other down. Um, the 2018 team was an absolute disaster. And it's crazy to think about how bad we were. This doesn't feel like that, mm -hmm. but it might be even more disappointing because the expectation for me, the expectations were higher for this team than they were for the 2018 team. Oh yeah. I definitely agree. So, with that. so I think I, th and even then the, the expectations on this team, they weren't like the, the highest of the highs. So, I mean, this team should still compete for a wild card spot, but they are, it's tough right now. Yeah. Disastrous. I mean, I first want to preface all this by saying that I am undefeated at City Field this year. I'm 4 0, which means I, I was going to say, what do you want to know? <laughs> Come on, Jerry. Hey, I'm just curious how you need to start showing up. No, nah, I mean, hold. with the 2018 comp that I, I mentioned uh, before the show. With them, it was weird because that was the year they started eleven and one, and I was like, "Oh, oh my god! Like, are we back? We're we're fully back, I think." And their month of June was worth worse than the month of May that we just witnessed. They went five and twenty-one, 
Uh, and I wanted to ask you that because I, I, I wonder what the psyche is of that clubhouse right now. Like it's got to be so frustrating because you look, you know me, I'm a numbers guy, right? I, I'm numbers mm-hmm. first. Uh, that's how I enjoy the game. And I get my enrichment from that. This lineup has seven hitters that are above league average. Their rotation is 60% above league average. So they have four relievers that are above league average. Like they have good players everywhere, but it's exactly what you said. They keep losing in big moments of the game and they lose every time in those moments. They seem to never get the big pitch or the big hit. And that's what I think makes this such a mind boggling mm-hmm. fan experience. It's because they are competing. They're not getting their ass beat every day. They're almost winning in mo- the majority of their games. It's just, it always seems to slip by somehow. And in the two weeks that we didn't record, I think it was probably the worst of it. I mean, the sweep from Cleveland, the two out of three to the Giants with the Bailey Grand Slam, the Jorge Lopez situation, which we haven't even talked about, even yesterday with Ketel Marte and all that. It's just been a mind-boggling experience that has them, what are they at now? They're at 24 and 35 on the year. I am. I still can't wrap my head around it. I did a whole two-page outline recapping everything, and I still can't believe the words I was writing down. So I don't know, man. Like, I guess I, I value your perspective on this because you endured that partially like in in some vein what 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 do you make of this like how how do you move forward if you're a player on the Mets like how do you continue to show up every day and keep your head up uh it's the little victories they're still in every game I felt like in in 2018 again I haven't taken a deep dive back into it but we felt like we were going to lose yeah even with DeGrom at his peak powers, Wheeler, Syndergaard had a great year. Mm. We had we had Fama at the end doing his thing. We just didn't – I didn't feel like we had the offense to win. And on top of that, like the dysfunction that we were having, and it just felt weird. That was the Cespedes year. Yeah. Yeah, and it was, and a lot of it was caused by the dysfunction in the. In was the that the coaching. bore? Was that the bore? Or I think it hole? was the surgery. The surgery, okay. So it was a different. Yeah, I'm not. I don't remember. Yeah, I think good. it was like he he had hurt his foot and then double surgery. Yeah, but it was mostly caused from Callaway lying to him. Like he's a loyal guy, mm-hmm. his loyalty, and then Callaway lied to us like 45 times in the first 30 days That's in cool. a weird weird way. So that team is different. This team, they don't have the same expectations. They don't have the same rotation. Yeah, I think the offense has better pieces than than what the 2018 team did. The coaching staff is way better. Uh, I think this is a, a championship caliber coaching staff. Um, they've just been unlucky, and I don't want to – give light to it they've been on clutch yeah i think that's so the biggest thing the op, the, yeah man like like uh that was a huge deekman's been fine this year deekman was He's the best option pretty, yesterday in my opinion like i don't it was I'm pretty good i'm going to drew smith there to be honest yeah first game from injury i, I mean you do what you got to do sure sure deekman like the i don't know that's true that's also a tough spot to put drew smith in probably was the best option so I think he made the right decision, Mendoza, to put Diekman in there. And then Diekman just didn't come through. Yeah. And that's on the player. That's on those guys. I mean, it's it's happened. Reed Garrett, who's been tremendous this year. Patrick Bailey, you know what I mean? Those yeah. are moments that you just, you're, they're not coming through for you. And when those add up, uh, it's tough. But but this is, this is a, this team has fight. They're, they're playing hard. Um, there's underperformance across the board in certain, in certain areas. Um, but this is, if I guarantee you, they feel differently than we did in 2018. You know, I, I do take some solace in that. That is, that is good to hear because like, I mean, this past month was, was pretty dreadful and there, there are bright spots that I think we can highlight, but it's exactly what you said there. I think they're the least clutch Mets team I've ever seen. And they've had so many opportunities to, to write the ship. I think the, 
the stat that I saw about, I'm sure everyone's seen it at this point, the, the bullpen blown lead thing, how they have six losses when leading after eight innings in May. No other team had two. You win those games and you're a 500 team, I think, or you're one game under, something like that. And it's just, that is, that's the whole season right now, essentially. Those losses in late innings. And it's so frustrating because it feels like the 2022 Mets got every turn they needed. They had something kicked right their way. And even in June last year, like leading up into that month, that team was still like afloat. They had fun wins in May, but it just feels so dreary because they, this team is, like you said, there weren't a lot of expectations. They are built to sell. And now that's kind of the direction we're heading in. This team looks like they're going to be big time sellers at the deadline. And it stinks because I, I think I saw glimmers of what the team could be uh, when they got J.D. Martinez in the fold, when Lindor finally started to click a little bit, they were getting good starts out of Seve. But it's just, like you said, it's never at the same time. And that's what I think makes it a, a really tough watch for Mets fans everywhere who definitely deserve a better product. Yeah, that, that's that's it. I, I don't, I'm not ready to sell the team yet, but they're definitely being shopped. I'll, yeah. I'll say that. Um, they still have a chance. This this crazy landscape of of how many wild cards you have. This team is very capable of of rattling off some wins. You get a hot Pete Alonso, you get Nemo going when he's feeling good. You get a hot JD Martinez, Lindor staying afloat. Francisco Alvarez is right around the corner. Which is you've nuts. got Mark Vientos looking great, um, and then Manai has been good. Good. Severino's shown flashes of greatness. Christian Scott's in Triple A for some reason. Like I think it's like a six man they, thing or something with London Yeah, because they they have some days off here. And, I'm sure I'll be and back. I don't. I hate it, but I I don't hate it. Yeah. Um. And they've done some things. Getting rid of Omar Narvaez. That shows me that you don't care. Yep. You want the best possible team. Tomas Nito was far and away better than him, and you're still going to need to give him some. Yeah, I'm giving Tomas Nito a round of applause. Hey, that's a nice story from this year. There's not it a lot really, of nice stories. Truly, is uh, a great story. This guy was written for written off. He had shown kind of what he was. He's he's not only like the eye surgery and yeah. stuff that he had to do. He put the work in. Didn't complain really. Just put his head down and started grinding, and he's been really good. Um, so that's awesome. And then they get rid of Narvaez, bring in Torrens, who's probably just there for uh, a little bit until Alvarez is sure. healthy. Yeah, but they're not afraid to move pieces, which also means that they're not afraid to trade guys if they get a really good offer. Yeah. Um, so there's there's some there are some possibilities of moving pieces. So the guys in the clubhouse are aware that this club will do whatever's best for this club, which yep. is awesome. Yeah. So if they start showing signs of life, like really gelling and putting it together and coming up clutch, you get Edwin Diaz back and he's feeling, he's looking dominant like himself. I think this is a good time for him to get himself together it changes everything. So there's a possibility, but this is definitely pointing towards sell, sell everybody you can. Yeah. I mean the month of June, which is historically a, a terrible month for any Mets team is going to be the make or break of the season. Uh, mm -hmm. You know me, I'm, they got two wins in a row against the Dynamax. I was kind of all the way back in. I was like, okay, let's just get hot. Let's let's why not us? You know, the nastiest thing about that third wild card spot is that they're still only five games out of a playoff spot, which is <laughs> utterly ridiculous. They're five the last out. team. They're the third worst team in the they're national the league. They're the third worst five, team in the national league, and they're five games. And they're out five of a games spot. out. That is yeah. ridiculous. I'm. I think I'm fully out on the third wild card spot now. Thank you. You joined the club. Uh, I, I was dope. in. I was like, oh, this is fun. Like, let's get wild card weekend. Let's get some stuff in the mix. It is becoming an atrocity, in my opinion. This team should be 15 games out. In, in normal standards, they would be seven games out of a playoff spot, which feels right for two months in for how poorly they've played. The fact that it's like if they played the Cardinals and they swept them, they would be like that within reach. You have a hot insane. week. You go, you go seven and oh, and this team is, is tied for a wild card. Spot I mean, that's what the Cardinals league. did, which is insane. They were so bad when we played, but them, that's what the terrible. Mets are capable of doing. Exactly. Then the Cardinals were worse. Yes, I agree. And they're in the playoffs right now. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I agree. I'm out on that third wild card yeah. spot, but uh, the, these, these Mets are, they've been losing in heartbreaking fashion. Yeah. 
The the Cardinals at least gave their fans the ability to turn the game off in the fourth inning. <laughs> the these Mets have been like, hey, we're about to lock this up. That's we're what two makes pitches, it worse. We're two outs away or something like they that. They won't free us. They won't just like let me go to bed or like let me do something else. I have to watch until the end. Um, That's what you want. You want guys to yeah. fight. No, um, but again, uh, this is this is definitely pointing. What the list of guys that you you sh- that you sent over in the outline the, yeah. on on what uh, Nightingale showed that who's their shopping nothing surprising on there from Pete Alonso all the way through um, everybody that's uh, a short term rental yep anybody so I mean we can do a, a quick run through of that um because it is important i think if it's coming from you know bob nightingale take it with a grain of salt whatever but if it's being reported this early it's got to be discussed um pete alonzo and jd martinez uh, both harrison bader and Marte in the outfield although i'm not sure how they're going to get that Marte money out there that contract's tough. they won't Sa- same thing with jeff mcneil that's a really tough contract to trade i think those two guys are going to be here it's most of the bullpen and then quintana Manaya, and severino the interesting thing for me is that um, one of the things we preached about this team, we got to eat some crow in the bullpen. We were wrong. The bullpens look tough. That's been a big uh, Achilles heel of the team. Uh, they do have depth. So even if they do trade these three starting pitchers, which by the way, having starting pitching rentals at the trade deadline is like gold. I think the Mets mm-hmm. should in, you know, investigate that opportunity if the price is right. Uh, but even if you trade those three guys, you know, you have McGill who's looked really good. I mean, I know I'm, I always let McGill fool me, but that splitter has looked fantastic. He looks like a new guy. Seven shutout innings against the Dodgers was the best start of his career. Um, Christian Scott's probably been the most fun starter to watch. And then Peterson, who's back now as well. Those three guys kind of just move into that spot. So the Mets can still compete even if you trade those guys. It's more so the big lineup pieces that I think will really tell us where the Mets front office is at regarding what they think of this team. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, a guy like Harrison Bader being sent off uh, for he's an easy trade kind of piece. The most clutch. But met. if they ever, if they, what's that? The most clutch met, I think, right? He yeah, has yeah. been, he's yeah, been yeah. absolutely, he's like the only one that's been super clutch. It's insane. He only hits when there's runners in scoring <laughs> position after the seventh inning. Let's, I'm going to pull up those splits really quick. His numbers yeah, he's be been crazy. crazy, but it's, it's the, the bullpen is still good. I still think they're a good bullpen. They're yeah. just having the, like I said, the most unclutch performances, whenever they need a guy to step up, they've fallen apart. A lot of it's overworked because they've been oh, in yeah. every game. Yep. Um, they're they're all pushed up a notch with Diaz not being the the at the back end there. There's a million reasons why they shouldn't be doing great, but they're actually still. I still think this is a strong point. So they need to show up this month to take care of this team because you're right. Tyler McGill has looked really good. Yeah. Like this is the most confident on the mound that I've seen him ever, even when he was throwing, you know, 98, he just looks like he looks like a pitcher that knows what he's doing pitch to pitch. Yep. Way he's carrying himself on the mound. He's not kind of just, he looks like he's, he's lost that rookie shine. And now he's like, a he knows how to pitch now, which yeah. is awesome. Um, I've always been a David Peterson fan. Of course. Having gone through hip surgery myself, understanding, like, it's such a weird gradual thing, hip pain, that you forget. It just is like this dull ache that prevents your body. And it's like a two-year process. And then all of a sudden, you have that surgery and you're free. And you're like, oh, my God, I forgot what it was like to have all of that flexibility, stability, and be pain-free. He looks like he's on his way. Again, it's been a while since he's pitched, so you can't keep pushing him. Um, but I like what I've seen from him. And again, Christian Scott, I'm so pumped to watch when he's back in the big leagues. So they have pieces that are exciting. They have, if they do sell, you can see a core of guys for the next year on what they're capable of doing, moving um, you know, outside of Pete Alonso. Right. Ooh, that, would, that would be a hard one to say goodbye to. Um, 
We'll see. This is the month. You're right. June, historically bad for the Mets, according to you. I know I tasted it personally. <laughs> um, this is it. This is this is do or die for them on if they want to keep this team together or if they they want to just break up the band and you know go solo on on each other. That I, sounded. I gotta. <laughs> we gotta rephrase that. This is staying in. This Let's is make uh, it the final family friendly here. <laughs> No, I mean, to, to what you said, it's it's so weird that not I guess not weird. I guess it's encouraging, if anything, that every all the homegrown Mets owned guys between Budo and Scott and uh, McGill, Peterson, Sean Reed, Fo- Dead Neil Nunez, like all these weirder reclamation projects or guys that have like transformed themselves. They've been the best performers and everyone that was kind of brought in as a free agent in some capacity has floundered a little bit. Like all the, like between Deakman blowing the game yesterday, although he had been good out had a really tough may, like all the guys that were brought in as sort of like the reinforcement arms just haven't fulfilled that role. And I think that's what kind of makes selling them a little bit easier, knowing that the homegrown Mets guys who you can't really trade or would be unwise to trade are going to be here after the fact. Like I'm actually pretty excited thinking of a rotation of McGill, Peterson, Budo, and Scott, because those are our guys. Like they got years of control. They're going to be here. They are pieces of that future that you're, you're trying to paint as a, you know, more luxurious than what we're watching right now. Uh, it's just, you know, it's you already, it's, you already give up on Budo. No, I mentioned him, man. He's, he's oh, in my, I, I thought, I thought you skipped just got to throw strikes. That's all. Just, just throw mm. some strikes. I will say the walks have been kind of better. You know, we were they talking have. about that. It's just more home runs <laughs> <Maybe>. now. <laughs> They they still like again. I, I'm not ready to write this season off, yeah. and I think this is where every Mets fan is. They're at that teetering point, and it's it's because Mets fans are smart and they understand where we are in this season. And with the trade deadline bumped up a full month over you know the last few years, this is it, man. Yeah. So they they got to figure it out. Um, they got to figure out what to do. I think, I think they could still. I think they could still have a run in them. Um, they're going to need. I think that you you mentioned Jeff McNeil, and I don't want to talk bad about a guy. Sure. Um, it's not. I'm not trying to talk bad, but he has been maybe the worst piece of the regulars. I um, mean, from him and Marte were in the bottom ten of WAR for the month of May. And those are two guys that are $40 million on this year's payroll. Something like that. Okay. Uh, May, yeah. but I'm talking as a whole. Oh yeah, sure. Since the Marte is right? still, I know, Marte, let's see, he's still a 110 OPS plus. So he's a 10% yeah. above average league average offense is down across the board, sure. especially in the national league. But Jeff McNeil is an OPS plus of 82. Yeah. A guy that's built for just contact. Is batting two twenty seven. His on base percentage is under three hundred. And you gotta think that like the whole Jet Williams thing, like him being this you know rock star prospect at the same position. I'm sure that has something to do with it, maybe. But at the same time, I doubt it. I don't know, man. I doubt like, it. What and happened? The, where, where was Jet Williams last year? He was surging through Double A. Yeah, but you don't care about Double A when you're in the big leagues. I'm trying to. I've never once looked over my shoulder. Way. I, I don't I fully don't understand the sharp decline of Jeff McNeil, the player, because it is, you know, pretty encompassing of this entire year as a whole. Just him basically disappearing from any realm of productivity. Yeah. So the the yeah, that's been tough. And then Lindor is another slow start, man. Yeah. You can't you can't start so slow from so many guys and dig yourself a hole because, uh, again, with the trade deadline right around the corner. You're behind the eight ball yep. and you got to, you, you have to give the front office some inkling that they're on the right path. So when you keep, you know, Lindor last year finished with a very good year, but he buried the team in the first half yep. offensively. I mean, his April between both seasons were, is like eerily similar. I think this year is actually worse. Um, but yeah, through April and May, it was a 700 OPS, 685. And then come June, the rest of his season is terrific. And in he's, May, he's, he's he had okay, such but... a bad April that his May, where he was 
pretty good. He's now a 101 OPS. It means he's like 1%, one tick above right. league average. Right. You I can't have that from your superstar. Yeah. No, I fully agree. And, you know, we haven't even mentioned Pete Alonso once this episode. I think we mentioned him in passing. And that's troubling to me, too, because usually any, you know, discussion about the Mets, he's at the forefront. Um, he hasn't had a, a bad year. I mean, he, you look at his numbers and they look like Pete Alonso numbers. But again, it's just that clutch factor. I feel like he, we haven't had a big Pete moment this year since the Detroit home run where he muscled that one out to center field. They won that game as their first one of the year. I can't remember another big Pete Alonso moment since then. I, I'm i going to look into it, but it feels like to me that Pete Alonso hits all his home runs when we're like plus or minus five runs already. I, I saw some people saying, uh, calling him Pete Duda because Lucas Duda was known for doing that a little bit too. You know, <laughs> oh, don't. I love Lucas Duda. <laughs> I love you. Lucas Duda too, but yeah. It I does mean, feel like his home runs come at – inopportune times you know wait let's let's look into but they have that's that's i guarantee you that's not true um i'm trying to look at some oh wow oh wow jerry when the margin is more than four runs pete alonso has a 1.349 ops and eight uh 900 slugging so it is what we're seeing and when it's late and close he has a 646 ops Wow. So there you go. That's good job by you picking that one up. I, it just felt, it felt like that. So <laughs> his OPS in games where we lose is 118 or, or 194 in games that the, the Mets win. It's 66. Like, wow. There's just, there's just a bunch of empty home runs. Yeah. It feels like that or empty RBI. Um, the wins and losses. I don't think I've ever seen that from a like core player that big of a Crazy. difference. It's nuts. Jeez. And it feels like that. So again, this is the most unclutch team. I think maybe carry some weight here, but the, again, last time I'm going to say it, these guys can turn it around. They do have the talent. You still, I still look at this roster and I still think that they have a run in the Braves are vulnerable. They are. They are underperforming as much as the Mets are, except their talent level started here to their standard, offensively. Yeah. yeah. So when you come down, uh, the Phillies are running away with it, but they haven't played anyone. I think they played ten teams, like ten games of teams over five hundred this year. I mean, you know, what I can tell you, Philly Isn't fans that... really love when they when you read this stat. Like we have a we have Shelfie in the office. Whenever I tease him about it, he gets annoyed. They've played six but, games against winning teams this year. Six. They're four and two. <laughs> hey, that's what you. I'm not discount. I still think they're. I think they're the best team in the National League, including the Dodgers. Yeah. Um. But the National League as a whole is terrible. That Diamondbacks team that went to the World Series last year, the Mets are better than them. And we split. Yeah. Yeah, and they should have won three. Um, yeah. Who else is in contention? The Padres? I mean, you don't it's know. The the Brewers are the other third team, which they're they're fun and scrappy, but I don't I didn't know. Aren't have the them Brewers pegged. leading the Central? Yeah. By seven games, Jerry. <laughs> yeah. Insane. And so I mean the it's the Cardinals, the Cubs. They're all kind of like, who are we? Everybody's in that same ilk. Yeah. You know, the whoever wins the National League East between the Phillies and the Braves looks like the Phillies. The other team is the number one seed. Yep. And then you have the Giants, the Diamondbacks, the the yeah, so everybody so there's this, there's the the winning teams and then there's just muck. And that's partially and, what kind of makes it so frustrating. It's a wide open field, man. It's like, wide open, but that's also why when a team is so unclutch, they can still reach these playoffs. So they won't, they I I'm won't interested let us to see I, I, I'm interested to see with this team, with this front office, do does making the playoffs matter or does selling to teams and making your team trying to build a real contender versus a team that just makes the playoffs? I want to see what this what this philosophy is. I think we'll we'll learn a lot about David Stearns uh, this month because one thread that I th- someone posted on Reddit, I thought was very interesting. 
Um, his first two years in Milwaukee, they were both losing seasons. Both years they sold at the trade deadline. And then they were a winning team for seven years in a row. I think they made the playoffs six times through that window with about 40% of the payroll that the Mets average year to year. So if this was kind of the plan, which it seems like in the way that it was constructed, it was, I think Stearns not necessarily is, you know, satisfied. No one's going to be satisfied with being 11 games under 500. But if things are making sense in his head, this does feel like it would be a sell-off. And maybe that's part of whatever plan they drew up to kind of reset the core or something like that. Um, it just gets hairy when, you know, you have huge names that are rentals like Pete Alonzo, like JD Martinez, like that are hard to explain to a fan base in dealing away. I don't, I don't think it's hard. This Mets fans know what they're, what, if you tell them the truth, which seems from every, from every indication David Stearns is a truth teller Yeah, from talking to players to telling guys how, where they stand like it or not, he's going to give you the truth. And I think if you sell this team, including Pete Alonzo, you're saying to this fan base and he would probably have a press conference and say, look, I didn't believe in this team and a real possibility of winning the world series. I am building for the future. We have the core group that we have. We have the big contracts. And then I'm going to find the best way to keep this team afloat and then go into the offseason and try to make a real contender. I think Mets fans would love to hear that. I would accept it. I agreed, because yeah. you, you have a bigger picture. And if you're a fan and you're like, we have a chance look at the Diamondbacks last year and you want to make a chase at the World Series because you might scrape the wild card. I don't disagree with you. Yeah. I tend to have a longer term view. Um, you know, it's the old uh, when they they pulled Steven Strasburg's innings limit right. because they planned on yeah. being, yeah, being contenders forever. You, you want, what is it? A bird in the hand? is worth two in the bush. You think you're going to be in contention next year because you have the guys and all of a sudden you're 30 games under 500. Yep. You know, baseball's a, a crazy sport, but I've liked what I've seen. Again, uh, David Stearns, the ability to send Brett Beatty down to say, I was yeah. wrong. Vientos might be the guy giving him a real opportunity. Beatty, of course, goes down and has a two-homer game. Um, but... These are moves that are not easy to make that they have made easily, if that makes sense. No, yeah. They've given guys really well. I've liked the the leash, the amount of time that they've given guys to try to figure it out. I like the way they've shuffled things. I I think the future is bright for this organization that might not be so bright on the twenty twenty four season. I think that's a good way to put it. Um we're about halfway, I'd say three quarters of the way through our show. We had a lot of nice long discussion there. We do have some voicemails. So mm. I, I, would, I would love to get to let's those. Let's do it. Let's, let's hear from the fan base a little bit. Uh, Jack, I, I slacked you a few of those. Can you do me a favor? Uh, I labeled one of them important because I wanted to make sure it got played. Um, so let's just let's you go that play one that first. one first. Yeah. yeah. The best made me want to die. Okay. So that's our first question. Just temperature of the fan base. I don't know the if you Mets got that. Make me want to die. I could, I couldn't hear it. It was the the Mets make me want to die in a in a Bronx accent. Oh, okay, nice. <laughs> Can you not? That's a uh, that Mets is important. And yes, three times over. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Yeah. It's the unclutchness. It's the losing it uh, at the end. It's having. It's the. If you're running in a marathon and you see the ribbons across and then you trip over yourself and get passed by 15 guys <laughs> and you don't meddle, that's what it feels like this it's entire amazing. month. It felt like perfect stride. We're going to be good. We're right along. And then you just eat pavement. Yeah. They make me want to die. He didn't leave his name. So shout out to that guy, whoever you are. Uh, we oh, got RIP. Maybe we got a call from our, uh, one of our coworkers as well. Uh, he left an interesting message. 
Hey, Jolly. Hey, Jerry. First time, long time. Listen, with the Diamondbacks only winning two times over the last six years in City Field and them splitting this series, winning two of four in 2024, what are your thoughts after the series? Is the Mets season over? Are the Diamondbacks going back to the World Series? I want to play Dalton. Um, that was Dalton feeling. <laughs> yeah, I love that. He wanted to know uh, if you could tell it was him or not. What was his question? I was well, distracted. I, I one wanted to play it because is that true? They've only won twice at City Field in like the last six years or whatever he said, which is insane. If he if Dalton's saying it, it's probably, it's probably true. True, right? <laughs> uh, I wanted to get. The, is that including the two wins that they just? Got? I think that those are the two wins. I think that's it, which is wow. nuts. Um, not the not the first part of the question. It was going into okay. So Jack said it was going into this, but still, that's ridiculous. Okay. Um, they, we doubled their win total. Good for us. Uh, not about the Mets part of that question, but I, I wanted to get your opinion on the Dimebacks because you kind of hinted at it a little bit. But I yeah. want I want to see what you think of this team because they are the defending National League champions, and I did like their roster, but I don't know, man. That felt like I don't I don't think they I don't I don't think they're very good to be honest. I don't. Their pitching is going to carry them, but their their lineup had three guys in it that I think were really good. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think. Well, one of them was uh, Jock, who I I want every season and I never get, and he's got a well. Jock is. 50. I mean, he's he's going to give you. You're not going to get regular playing time. He can't play the field anymore. Yeah. You're stuck. He are you going to platoon him with JD Martinez? I'll take JD Martinez. That'd be a fun platoon, though. It's a good platoon. I'm not platooning JD Martinez because <laughs> he goes the other way against righties. Anyway, I mean they had Cattell Marte. Obviously, he looked like a hero. What are we doing? Yeah. Uh, pitching to that guy, and when he's give like understand that this guy's on fire. And you don't pitch to him in a game where he's everything he's locked in. Yeah. Swallow your pride, get to the next guy because they're not that good. I mean, Christian Walker's really good. Uh McCar- Jake McCarthy looks really good. But outside of that, they're just playing okay ball. And then their bullpen is good. It's hurting. You know, I think I love Paul Seawald and what he's been. I think Ginkle is really good, but mm. Zach Gallon going down. Yeah, it's tough. That's there. I feel the same way with with when Singa went down for uh for the Mets as I do when Gallon goes down for them. It's hard to. Survive, I don't think though. they have the top end talent to do this again. I, I it's a, what did Corbin Carroll? Yeah, looks terrible. This is one of the most exciting players to watch in the game. One of the best he looks like. It may be the easiest out I've ever seen. He looks uh, injured, to be honest. He looks hurt. Like that shoulder? Yeah. You know, that that was a, a, a moment last year. I don't know, man. But I, I don't think they're uh, – sorry, Dalton. They're not going back to the World Series. There you go, Dalton. There's your, your, there's your hard truth about the Arizona Diamondbacks. I had to give it to him. All right. I thought they were Jake Snakes. Well, yeah, but they're only Jake Snakes when they're winning, apparently. I don't know. I know. <laughs> he has so many teams. It's hilarious. Uh, we did get a question about Brett Beatty and Mark Vientos, which I do want to get to. Wait, wait. Corbin Carroll's OPS plus is 64. He's under 200. His OPS is under 600 on the year, too. And this is a year yeah, where I mean, there's a sophomore slump. I've seen guys have sophomore yeah. slumps. This is this is one for the ages. It's a bummer. He was a really nice guy when uh, me and Jack met him in the Arizona clubhouse. Good. I had to do a little flex there. Still you had like running. the same haircut for a minute. Yeah. Uh, Jake kept calling me Corbin careless, which I thought was funny. <laughs> <laughs> so. uh, okay. It's yeah. Let's get back to the Mets. This is not a D backs pod. Sorry, Dalton. This one was about Brett Beatty's demotion. Mark Vientos promotion. Hey, Jerry. Hey, Jolly. It's Connor out from Las Vegas. Love you guys. You guys are awesome. Love listening to you guys every week. My question for you guys this week is with Brett Beatty being sent down recently, how long do you think they're going to give Mark Vientos time to show that he can prove that he can be the guy at third base? I mean, with Brett's defense being a little bit better recently, but his bat slugging off and Vientos showing that he can hit pretty well, how long of a leash do you think that they're going to give 
Vientos full bore at third before they bring Beatty back because it sounds like they're not going to be giving them that long down in AAA. Thanks, guys. Have an awesome episode. Love listening to you guys every week. Thank you, Connor. You want to take lead or you want me to? Uh, I'll say what my thoughts are. Sure. Uh, I think this is this is Vientos' job for a while. Yeah. Kind of the same because because Brett Beatty has been has been given the first position how many years in a row now? Like he's be been given every now. yeah every opportunity to be the guy to take off with it. He's had stints where he's played every day. Um, Vientos hasn't gotten any bit of that. Um, he hasn't gotten consistent playing time at third. He hasn't gotten consistent at bats. This is his chance. He's, he's getting one that he's earned that Beatty had these. Beatty hasn't deserved it. Yeah. No offense. I still think he's a good player. Um, I believe in Beatty. Like you believe in Tyler McGill. Um, Tyler's had more success than Brett Beatty by far. Yep. I think Beatty could be a good player, but he, he, he deserved the the demotion and Vientos has earned a long run, especially that he's providing offense. This team needs that offense. If he makes some, some errors at third base, which he hasn't, I, I have my wrong in there. He's looked clean as far as I know. Yeah. He's looked clean. They're gonna they're gonna let it go because the the alternative is zero offense. Yeah. So, um, to me, this is his for six weeks. I mean, at least. And if he if he is league average defensively and league average offensively, I think it's his job for the rest of the year. Uh, an interesting point some people were pointing out is the fact that Brett Beatty has 30 games at AAA in his career, which is weird because he's been a big leaguer for three years. He, you would think that he, he would got more seasoning there, but it was because of the Escobar injury that he originally came up. Then he was kind of in that weird halfway point where he was raking at AAA in 2023, so they brought him up. I think this is kind of what he needs, man. I mean, the, it's clear that the, the glove has arrived for him. I really liked watching Brett Beatty play defense. He looked like a big league third baseman in the field. Um, but outside of the first... 15 games of the season the bat is just very clearly not ready yet and mark vientos like you said for an anemic offense showed it very quickly in tough opportunities too like but going back to that st louis home run the walk-off that's a pinch hit opportunity a late game opportunity this is the first real time we've seen him playing every day and he is making the most of it so far so it's nice to see and it's nice that we have another option like it's not just brett Beatty or bust like you have this other piece you might as well get some use out of him. I think it's going to be until the trade deadline. I think uh, they might be selling bats at the deadline. You might be able to shift Vientos back into the DH spot once Martinez might be out the door, and then you bring back Beatty. But right now, I really like the decision because I think this is what the team needs. I think they need to see what Mark Vientos can be. They need to get offense in the lineup and sacrifice a little bit of defense because they've already been one of the worst defensive teams in baseball anyway, so you might as well just double down and get more runs out of it. Uh, not like they're, yeah, it's they're not, not like it's know. been so good. Exactly. It's not going to, I don't think it's going to make or break, you know, the one run games they're blowing anyway. And for Brett Beatty, get him double his sample at AAA and see if anything changes. If he's hitting two homers a day and he comes back up and maybe that fixes him, or, you know, maybe this is the line where he's at. Maybe there is some sort of issue there, but this was a, a find out year for Brett Beatty. And I don't think we're there yet for Mark Vientos. We haven't seen him that consistently. So this is going to be his prime opportunity. The month of June, it's important for the team as a whole. It's really important for Mark Vientos to establish himself and prove that this nice hot streak that he's had, which, by the way, has been the same length as Brett Beatty's hot streak at the beginning of the season. How real is it? Do it for a full month, and then we'll go from there. And can you consistently put the work in defensively at third base? Yeah. Like, can you be serviceable? Um, they're both just 24. Which is nuts. They're my Yeah, age. I mean, they're both still so young. Their their careers are in front of them. Uh, I made my debut at 24. Like, and these guys are seasoned vets, especially Beatty. Um, he's got some maturing to do. He's got uh, baseball so strange that 
it's not like the NFL where, all right, you have to come straight out of college and you're your peak player and running backs are like at their best the right. first two years that they play. This game has so many nuances and it's such a mental, you know, it's such a mental game of learning how to fail and learning how to navigate 162 game season. He's not done, but he just hasn't been one of the few guys that could, he had a potential to be elite at an early twenties age and it just didn't work out. And it doesn't mean that he's bad. He's behind in development. It's, it means that he, got thrust into a position because he was playing really well and the opportunity was there and he just has a run with it. So Vientos' turn. Um, I've been impressed, man. I, I don't know. I don't know if his defense is ever going to come around to be um, league average. Mm. I hope it does, but I don't care right now. I, what I care about is this guy's performing. So get him in the lineup. Get him in wherever you got to put him. Uh, he's earned it. Well put. And I mean, youth is struggling across the league right now, not just on the Mets, like Corbin Carroll, we just talked about. Spencer Torkelson got sent down. Reed Detmers got sent down. Like it's it's been tough this year for a lot of like first year, second year kind of players. So hopefully Mark Vientos can be an outlier in that sense and, and really shine with the opportunity. Um I think we've officially talked ourselves into circles a little bit on the. I think so. Nets. I, I think, think that's, so. Thank I, you, fans. If you stuck in there with yeah. us, I thought it was a good discussion. But there's only so much you can say about a team eleven games under five hundred. Yeah, uh, when you're this is it. This is thought. this month. It's today is June third. Season starts now. The, it really does. They're they're they have a two month long season to decide if they're if this team is going to stay together. They have shown zero signs that they're gonna they're gonna make a push. They fight. They're they're gritty. They're I have respect for everybody that plays this game uh, for the Mets because they are fighting. They're not rolling over. They're just unclutched so far. Uh, which uh, you keep smiling, but it's true. They've you they've can only been just laugh, like Jerry. I know, man. So. Again, they're not they're not this team that I'm like, how dare their superstar not, you know, not show up every day. Right. There's nothing to be particularly mad about. Um, they're just not winning ball t- ball games. And if they continue to not win, they're gonna they're gonna sell it off, rightfully so. Well, here's what I'll tell you, Jerry. You got three games in DC against a team that shouldn't be above you in the standings. And you get to see McGill, Peterson, and Severino, three our three best starters right now, in my opinion. And then you go to London, and you got the whole world watching. And maybe you can take two from the best team in the National League. Who the hell knows? I'm so jealous that they get to go play in London. How I feel bad for cool. Christian Scott. He doesn't get to go. He totally earned his spot, and now he's stuck in ah, that does suck. Minneapolis. He probably didn't even have a passport, little kid. <laughs> They're like, sorry, bud, you don't have your passport. Yeah, we, we can't, can't expedite it. it in time. You can't drink here. Uh, There's no point in taking you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, that's just going to be such a cool experience. If there's any uh, Mets fans out there that listen to uh, Shea Station and they're going, hit us up because I want to know like what what your plans are because mm. that would be so cool. I was S and Y's not even getting to go. Really? They you know what I mean? You. Those guys because they're going to be national games. Yeah. So uh, that this is when radio is superior to TV. Oh yeah, yeah we've talked gone. about this a yeah, couple yeah. times. But Howie Rose gets to continue to do his job regardless. You know, you get Gary Keith and Ron have to get kicked to the yeah, curb. I mean, for the, the same national thing with guys games too, right? Howie's always doing his thing. They get kicked. That's to the such curb. a cruel thing to be a part of it. And when it's fun and when it's iconic, you know. There's moments then yeah. the, then you're just like watching on the sidelines, it's crazy. But I want to. I'm also. I'm very excited for them to go to London for the fans. Um, this is it. Is the is this team gonna get their asses kicked by a lesser than Nash, uh, Washington Nationals team? Uh, mm-hmm. Are they gonna go to London and get destroyed by a far superior Philadelphia Phillies team? If so, they they might be the first team to be like we're we're out. Come get our Maybe. guys. Yeah, honestly, because there's something to the market on jumping early. Because some teams that are like, 
here's an advantage. Some teams will trade for a guy and then they'll fall apart and then they'll trade them at the deadline for themselves. So yeah. there's, there's, if you're jumping out in front, you know, I believe that David Stearns will do the right thing at the right time. Um, but if you force his hand early by just getting steamrolled in DC, yeah. we'll see, man. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to wait too long cause then you, you, you're losing that advantage almost, you know, teams know that you got to sell. So maybe they offer you less. I, the Marlins training Luis Arias in early May, I thought maybe got them the best return they could have got. Um, but the 10 a.m. on Diego Sunday, got the best return. Yeah, it's true. Um, I just saw on Sunday they play at 10 a.m., which I think is funny. Uh, nice early morning game. I don't think I've ever seen that before. 10 a.m. game. <laughs> well, 10 a.m. where? In London on Sunday. Oh, oh 10 a.m. our time. time. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Jerry. You've Hopefully, never been on the West Coast. Uh, Hold on. I just want to we, – we brought up Luis Arise. I'm doing it for my benefit. Yeah. You know what he's batting in the – 26 games that he's been uh, a Padre. Does it start with a four? It's damn close. 391. Damn. His OPS is 868. Damn. He might win a third batting title with a different team. That's crazy. So we'll see. Let's, Let's go see. Mets. Let's, Let's figure out. Mets. Are you going to win? I'm Let's still going to watch. I'm, I'm going to let them fool me. Whatever. If they win two in DC, I'm all the way back in. Life is much better when you have you, when you believe. So it's so much more fun to think that this team's going to turn it around. Put that quote on a shirt. Life is much better when you believe dash Jerry Belevins. I'm going to, I'll sell it. <laughs> I won't, I won't put the dash though. I'll, I'll be like Gandhi. An- said, Gandhi said that <laughs> Mahatma. All right. Mahatma. Jack, great to see you again. I've missed you, my friend. You're talking to me, right? Not our producer. Yeah, both Jacks. Okay, I can't right. see the our sultry audio jack. Pick your head up. Why not? Is there any Yankee hat? <gasps> He's wearing a Yankee hat. He can't pick his head. Of course head. he is. Play that outro music, please. It's the best part of the show. Besides the You're outro the best music. part of the show. Oh, come on. Life is better when you believe, guys. See you in London. Jerry and Charlie, thank you all for coming. Confidence for the accent, I appreciate it. Bro. We will see you a bottle of water. Bottle. We'll be back home. Station. The best made me want to die. <laughs>